Now, most views we get of Madagascar, most of the visions we see projected in um, wildlife documentaries shown on TV in the UK, show a kind of a very sort of pure, wild Madagascar. A Madagascar with no people in it. It's always the lemurs, it's the wildlife. Um, uh, whether it's the fantastic injury found in the eastern rainforest of Madagascar or um, Alison Jolly's specialty, she spent 50 years studying these beautiful ring-tailed lemurs from the south of Madagascar. Um, but whatever we see, whatever image we have, it's lacking the people. And Madagascar is home to 22 million people. And I hope, if I do nothing else, I want to, in this brief talk, sort of put the people back um, in this image of Madagascar. So my own relationship with Madagascar started um, 13 years ago now when I uh, started working in Madagascar for my PhD research and I was working on crayfish, looking at the sustainability of crayfish harvesting. This is an endemic species found in Madagascar only and they're very important in local livelihoods. So I was doing work on sustainability. But to do this, I spent two very happy years living in this village, Bevelhaj, which is around the edge of the eastern rainforest. It's about four hours walk from the nearest road. Um, my father-in-law and mother-in-law actually very gamely came out to visit us once, and they will attest it's quite a hike. Um, so my husband and I spent two very happy years living there. And um, I was doing a lot of field work in the forest, and when you work in rainforests, um, you get leeches. Um, but, and though I, was in the, I started out as an ecologist, I soon realised that actually the people were sort of more interesting to me and such an important part of the whole question of sustainability. So um, I started to increasingly work more and more around the social issues in conservation. And what really made this possible for me was because I'd spent two years just living in Beverly Hush, just kind of getting on with life as you do in a village, helping my neighbours with, whether it's rice, um, harvesting or whatever, because I was just kind of involved in life. I had the time as a PhD student. Um, I don't know whether my own PhD students standing at the back there feel they have time, but I certainly did. I think it was a golden era of being a PhD student then. And I did have time. And I spent, yeah, as I say, well, it was more than two years, and a lot of that time was just hanging out, joining in. And that gave me the chance to learn Malagasy. And I'm forever grateful, because I've made my career in Malagasy conservation, and having the language skills has been really helpful, but more than that, it's been a huge privilege to kind of have that insight into a different culture that I just wouldn't have had. So my years in Bovel Hus were just incredibly important, and I know my husband thinks the same. So I still work in Madagascar today, but I don't do field work really. The, the kind of um, I want to put an out of office reply on my email saying that I was in the field in Madagascar. My my husband tore the whatever out of me. He was very sarcastic. Um, he said, you're in the field? You're in Tanner, in an office. Oh, actually, that's true, yes. Because nowadays I very seldom spend real time in the field. But I work with this wonderful organisation, Madagascar for Cuts, which we're raising money for tonight. And just to emphasise the close relationship between Madagascar for Cuts and Bangu University, four of the people just in this photo here, or here and now, we will hear from later, Tuki, Sabik, and uh, Julie, uh, who's the director of Madagascar for Cuts, have all spent um, quite extensive periods of time in Bangor, working with myself and my colleagues here. So, thinking, okay, I've got to introduce Madagascar. What do I start by saying? What do I say? How do I introduce the whole country, 22 million people? So I thought of four things um, that you might not know about Madagascar, but are worth knowing. The first of these four things is, there are no zebras. <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> I do think it's a shame that the vision that you know, most children the world over, I'm sure none of the children in this room think there's zebras in Madagascar, but the vision that most children have in Madagascar is of these four guys, the giraffe, the hippo, and obviously this needs no more saying, there are no zebras in Madagascar. The second thing about Madagascar is it's not in Africa. Now, when you say, if you, if you say to a Malagasy, if you imply when you're in a conversation with a Malagasy person, you kind of include Madagascar and Africa together, they'll often look a little bit kind of, Madagascar is not Africa. And they do have a point. So, although Africa, and Mad although Madagascar is right up there, close to the continent of Africa, biogeographically it's completely different. So, Madagascar broke off from Africa before most of the groups, the animal groups we associate with Africa even evolved. And culturally, it's not Africa. 
So if you compare a Malagasy village and villages on the east coast of, Madag of Africa, they'll feel very different. The houses are a different shape. Um, the staple diet is very different. Malagasy's just love rice. It's always rice. What you had tonight is very classic Malagasy food. Um, and, the fact, and that's because the Malagasy culture really is much more heavily influenced from the east. And that's because Malagasy people are ethnically not African. Well, okay, we're all African, but so are we all here. Everyone evolved out of Africa. Um, but the people that first colonized Madagascar came from the east. They came from, um, well, the, the area where the language group is most similarly related is actually Borneo. So the lowlands of Borneo, there's a language that's spoken that is most similar to Malagasy as spoken today in Madagascar. So when Malagasy say they are not African, they really have a point. It's, it is a very distinct, the culture comes from the east rather than across from Africa. The third thing you might not know about Madagascar is it has really deep roots and deep connections with Wales. Now, some of you might have thought that we had these colours, the green, white and red tonight in our, in our theme, because it's the colours of Wales. But it's also the colour of Madagascar. Um, you can see the two flags intertwined there. And the, the connections, I think it's probably a coincidence, the colours of the flags, but the connections between the two countries go back a very long way. Um, in 1814, uh, David Jones, a young missionary from Cardiganshire, went out to Madagascar and um, his purpose was to translate the Bible into Malagasy. But of course to do that he had to develop a written form of the Malagasy language. So although Malagasy had been written down um, by Arabic, using Arabic script by Arabic traders many centuries before in what's known as the Sora Bay, the kind of big writing, um, that wasn't popularised or widely used. And to develop this um, a Bible, the missionaries, of course, had to write it down in a way that could easily be learned. And they used, um, they used the Roman script that we all use. Um, and it was a close relationship between David Jones and King Radama I of Madagascar. He was very pro-writing, was very quite interested in Christianity and very keen to get the language written. Um, although it's said that originally David Jones and his colleague uh, David Griffiths, another Welsh missionary, originally used Welsh spelling to spell Malagasy words. And later, when King Radama found out just how minority Welsh uh, spelling was, how a small portion of the world used it, he asked them to redo it using French and English pronunciation sounds. The, um, the missionaries, so uh, just an interesting point of Malagasy history, at the end of King Radama I's reign, when he died, he died quite young, um, one of his wives took over, and she was incredibly anti-Christianity, and all of the, um, any missionaries were sent away, and there was a big kind of backlash against anything Western during her reign, um, and many Christians were killed during that period. And the fourth and final thing you might not know about Madagascar, but it's worth knowing, is it has really great music. So we've been enjoying some of it tonight, and after the talks, uh, Sarabidi is going to introduce the national dance of Madagascar to you, the Afindra Findrao. And I hope you will join in, she'll talk all about that later. But the point is, Madagascar music is fantastic, it's a huge range of music. Wherever you go in Madagascar, there's always music. So whether it's, you know, this guy, there's a guy from the village I used to live in who'd always have his little homemade guitar-y thing, strum away a tune, or whether it's at a wedding, this is a wedding of some friends of mine recently, where both the bride and the groom's parents got up and took it in turns to compete with their fantastic singing. Um, music's a big part of life in Madagascar. So when I was doing my field work, I spent long periods of time camped in the forest. Well, we generally do five nights at a time, go back to the village, go back to the forest, and I was always with these guys. And as a naturalist, someone who comes here, I was very interested in bird watching, and you know, I have the background that when you go into a forest, you're quiet, you listen, you you know, what, what can I see? I want to see as many birds as I can. Here I was in the Malagasy rainforest, first time in my life, thinking, wow, fantastic, I'm going to see all these species I've never seen before. You know, I'm going to be really quiet, I've got my binoculars with me. That didn't last long. These guys, from morning till night, they would sing, all day, every day. And actually, I mean, a lot of my Malagasy um, vocabulary and a lot of what I've learned about history and culture in Madagascar comes from the songs I learned from these guys. And in fact, I still sing to my daughter many evenings, my, my children, I sing a lot of Malagasy the songs I learned from these guys in the evening to them. And these songs tell stories about the whole history of this area of Madagascar. 
So the eastern rainforests, the Tanala area in particular, was very hard hit in 1947 when there was a big Malaga uh, uprising against the French colonial rule. And many people were killed. There was um, Senegalese mercenaries came into the area and killed a lot of people. It's a really unpleasant time in history. Many of the songs talk about that time. Many songs talk about a paradisa socialista, so a socialist paradise, from the time of Ratsirika's reign, when Madagascar was a socialist regime. Um, and there's more recent songs. Um, one song that they used to sing regularly was one that they sung when uh, me and my husband had arrived in the village and built our house at the opening of our house. A new, a new, a new verse of a very traditional song was added. So these songs were always there. So the people in this room are probably above averagely interested in the environment. You come to an event at the zoo, many of you I know um, have a long-standing interest, you might be members of the zoo, you have a long-standing interest in wildlife. Um, and the matter, of course the wildlife of Madagascar is amazing. But of course the flip side of that is, as you're all I'm sure aware, there's huge environmental problems in Madagascar as well. Deforestation, soil erosion, over-exploitation, over-hunting, all of these are big problems. So I wanted to end with the Malagasy proverb. The Malagasy language is a really rich and beautiful language, and it's very rich in proverbs. They have, a, have nice little sayings for all occasions. And the last, the, so I wanted to end on this saying, which literally just means, together rock and separated with just sand. And I've included here two photographs, one of the student group that organised tonight, Bangor University environmental students that are interested in forest conservation, and a class of um, students at University of Tanner, which I gave a talk to last year. They're all studying environmental related subjects. And I think with these motivated students all really interested in conservation issues in Madagascar, then hopefully the future could be positive.